Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2021 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is David Mickle, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel, Sabermetrics versus the World, our analytics baseball's answer. Our panelists today are Sarah Gellis, Director of Research and Development for the Houston Astros, Bill James, author, historian, and statistician, Meg Rowley, Managing Editor of Fangraphs, and Josh Ruffin, Advanced Scouting Analyst for the Minnesota Twins. Our panel will be moderated by Ben Lindbergh, author and staff writer for The Ringer. The panel will run for 35 minutes and we will leave 10 minutes at the end for questions. Please ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag Sabermetrics. Questions will then be selected by the moderator. With that, I will turn it over to Ben. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Sorry, we can't all be together in person. Uh, but when this conference was founded 15 years ago, there was still some debate about whether sabermetrics worked, whether it actually increased our understanding of the sport and was worth paying attention to at all. And things have changed. Now the debate seems to be about whether sabermetrics works too well. And it seems as if sabermetrics is sort of on trial in the court of public opinion. There seems to be a growing perception that the analytical approach to team building has had some unintended consequences that may make baseball a less spectator friendly sport. So there's always been some degree of dissatisfaction with the aesthetics of the sport, but those concerns seem to be heightened today as we see strikeouts increase and home runs and fewer balls in play and a little less action on the field. So we wanted to examine the extent to which Sabermetrics is actually responsible for those changes and what, if anything, can be done about it. So, Bill, I'll, I'll go to you first since you coined the term Sabermetrics. I wanted to start out by asking whether you ever envisioned that your work and what it inspired might lead to significant changes on the field and to what degree you think that Sabermetrics and the analytical mindset is actually connected to some of the trends that we've seen in the game today. Uh, <clears throat> I have always been given more credit than I deserve for uh, the development of the field and more blame than we deserve for problems with the game. The, uh, uh, I absolutely never envisioned to any extent whatsoever that uh, sabermetrics might come to have the influence that it has had. That was a complete shock to me and still is every day. Uh, to be honest, I don't see the link. I don't see the causal link between the things we do and the aesthetic problems with the game. Uh, I think that it's a superstitious connection because these two things kind of happen at the same time. One of them must be causing the other one, but I don't think it is. I don't, I mean, I plead not guilty. <laughs> I don't have nothing to do with this. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to ask, you know, I, I think that some of these trends are long-term trends. If you look back over a century or more, you'll see that strikeout rates have been increasing, home run rates have been increasing. And so to pin it on some of the innovations of the last 15 to 20 years might seem short-sighted. And yet, We've also seen 15 going on 16 consecutive seasons now with an increasing strikeout rate. It seems as if we are in a, an era where these trends are really accelerating and, and perhaps exacerbated by some of these analytical innovations. Uh, at least it seems to me that, you know, whether it's uh, catcher framing, widening the strike zone, or, uh, you know, some of the defensive shifting innovations, which you know I tend to think are, are maybe given a little bit too much credit as well, but certainly the realization that strikeout hitters are, are not necessarily less productive on the whole and that strikeout pitchers are very valuable. You don't see any connection between the sudden you know steep increase in these things in recent years and the way that this way of thinking has uh, sort of taken root in front offices. A train running downhill will accelerate, and it's an out-of-control train, and it is accelerating. But the, as you say, the train was moving at quite a good speed before we got involved in it. The, uh, uh, um, I agree that this is, it would be helpful if we could invent some way 
to slow the train down. But the, the problem is not that we realized that uh, these things were true. It is that these things were true. And those things being true are these. One, that strikeout pitchers are more effective than guys who don't strike out people. And two, that historically, batters who strike out, like Mickey Mattel and Jimmy Fox and Mike Schmidt, are not bad hitters. They tend to be good hitters. What causes this endless increase in strikeouts is those two facts, that everybody is looking for strikeout pitchers, but nobody's looking to avoid strikeout hitters. And the problem is caused by the fact that that's true. It's not caused by the fact that we realize that that's true. It's caused by the fact that it is true. So that's the way I see it. So let me ask someone from a team who's with us today. I guess, uh, Sarah, I will ask you about this because your job working for a team is to help that team win, not to make baseball more entertaining. Uh, but I wonder whether you feel conflicted at all about the way that helping that team win might advance some of these trends or whether you see a connection there in that, you know, certainly your team, the Astros, has uh, been a, a team that has gone for strikeout pitchers and, you know, has uh, been at the forefront of player development trends that perhaps have uh, exacerbated some of these pre-existing trends in, uh, in the stylistics of baseball. Yeah, I guess uh, the short answer of whether I feel conflicted is no, um, because <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm here to win. And I think everyone with a team would say the same thing. Um, I, and I guess to reframe your question, like the, sabermetrics and the innovation that has been driven by sabermetrics is what got me into baseball and has what made baseball a lot more interesting to me. So I also don't necessarily accept the premise that, you know, these changes have made baseball less watchable. Um, I think maybe we need to do a better job of explaining and framing, you know, why shifting is innovative and what, you know, why it's exciting that certain teams are more strategic and are able to kind of outsmart opponents, um, you know, and what's the next shifting going to be. Um, to me, that's very um, watchable and very, um, you know, uh, interesting the same way you know I, I think the same thing is true in other sports like I am interested by what teams are doing to stay ahead of the curve and outsmart their opponents um, and sabermetrics is obviously an angle of that and something that supported that so I think maybe we as an industry need to do a better job of educating our fans um, about you know from that angle. Well, that's a good segue to Meg, I think, because uh, <laughs> as the managing editor of one of the more prominent sabermetric sites, you are at the forefront of explaining these changes to fans. So I wonder how you think about, I guess, A, you know, doing a, a better job, a good job of briefing fans on what's actually happening here, what the trends are and what's causing them. And then, you know, whether there is an obligation to point out the ways in, in which these changes might be hurting the sport or helping the sport? How do you make it interesting without being all doom and gloom? Well, I think that part of it comes from, as Sarah said, helping people to understand um, the parts of the modern game that are really exciting, right? That we are able to say with greater specificity, not only who is good, but why they're good and how they're good. Um, and I think that having conversations around that can really help to change the way that fans look at the game when they're in the ballpark, right? They come to appreciate skills that they might not have. But I think we have to couple that with a humility that there isn't a universal aesthetic that's preferred in baseball. There are a lot of fans who do miss stolen bases, right? They don't care that they're inefficient sometimes and that the calculus around that is really clear. They want to see guys run. They want to see the ball in play. And so I think that the balance that we try to strike is to help people to understand the game as it is while inviting debate about the game as it should be. And there might be a lot of different answers to that question uh, and we can kind of come at them from different angles. So I think where, um, you know, when, when Sabermetrics was first getting off the ground, we had this, you know, we had this fierce desire to prove that what we were doing was a better way to understand baseball. We've, you know, look at who's on this panel, look at this conference, that conversation has sort of been settled and I think the opportunity we have now is to not only continue the education process about why teams do what they do and how they think about it and what kinds of players that allows to play the game, but to also say, okay, now having spent 20 years doing this, what rule changes might we want to contemplate to course correct if we think we've gone too far in one direction or the other? And 
where do we want to let innovation just kind of play itself out and see how teams respond to the shift, right? So I think that that conversation is, is interesting. Um, and I think it allows us to look at more than just the puzzle box, but also to still appreciate the puzzle box. Because I agree with Sarah, like this way of thinking about baseball just changed my engagement with the sport. And I think that there's still a really important place for that. And I don't want us to lose it. But I do think that we want to, you know, take care of baseball. And part of that is having critical conversations about the direction the game is headed, even if at the end of that conversation, we say, this is fine. Like we like strikeouts, home runs are fun. Like this is a good state for the sport to be in, but we need to be having that conversation really regularly so that if some sort of intervention um, or change of approach is necessary, you know, we can maybe try to arrest the, the momentum and inertia of that fast moving train. And Josh, coming at this from the scouting side, albeit the analytically oriented scouting side, I wonder whether you think there is still a path to sort of a, a biodiversity in baseball, whether there is still room for multiple types of players, multiple skill sets. Is everyone focusing on the same sort of skill set that might lead to high strikeouts, let's say, or is there a way that we could potentially shift back to maybe you want more of a high contact hitter, or maybe there is room for more than one type of hitter in the game today? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, there's some mechanisms in place that might allow it to happen naturally, as you can imagine, as more and more teams kind of want the same players and there's not that many players and the demand goes up, you might start to see an inefficiency that allows you to go for a different type of player. And then all of a sudden that style might kind of come back into play or might be a little bit more legitimate based on, you know, what it takes to acquire players who have that skill set. Um, but I, I do think it's kind of one where, you know, Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find like the optimal way to play in terms of how to optimize our team sometimes. And so that is going to kind of lead us towards a singular point, um, you would imagine. So I think you will start to see a flattening of style. Um, but I do think, you know, yeah, referring to your question earlier, you know, from the team's perspective, that's not something that necessarily becomes a concern of ours. Um, but from, you know, a league perspective and a sport perspective, that is something where you, you do want to see that diversity. I, I can think of a, a num numerous amount of students who like college basketball more than NBA basketball, even though it's not as good of a product, but just because you might see more different styles of play um, rather than um, kind of how the NBA has evolved today. And Bill, looking at this from a historical perspective, it, it seems as if left unchecked, these trends will continue to be, as you said, the runaway train. So has baseball history shown that the only way to escape this cycle is for the league to step in and take some proactive steps, or maybe it's too late to call them proactive at this point, but is that the only way we can escape this cycle? Because uh, it seems as if with this many consecutive seasons of rising strikeout rates that this is not going to be a problem that just sorts itself out. Right. <clears throat> Uh, it, uh, you're right, at this point, they're not proactive steps, they're reactive steps, but yeah. Uh, and um, the uh, I would disagree with those who say that uh, the product on the field is fine. I mean, we are, we have, the product on the field is nowhere near as universally popular as it was before these trends began and uh, we have to do something. The problem, the problem in my mind really goes back to the designated hitter rule. When the designated hitter rule was passed, there was a, an uproar about it and a great many fans decided that we can't change anything in baseball. We have to play it ex by exactly the same rules that's always been played by, which was a terrible way to think about it because in reality we had we had been tweaking the game by improving the rules regularly up to that time but then we became afraid to do that and we got behind the curve we just allowed the game to change and change and change because we were afraid to tweak the rules to prevent it from running away from us uh, so i think we've i think we've got to do that i, I don't think it's an option to to sit on our butts and let things happen anymore. I think we have to address the real and undeniable aesthetic issues of the game. That would be my, my opinion. 
So Sarah, this is not your job, uh, but it would affect your job. If the rules change, then you have to adapt accordingly. So when do you think is the appropriate point or the appropriate process for MLB to step in and say, well, you're doing what works for you, individual teams, and it's helping you win, but perhaps it's not benefiting the sport as a whole. And so we will have to take action here. Have we reached that point? Do you think that there is a, a certain process that MLB should be following to institute those changes? Yeah, um, it's a good question. And, you know, even if I don't necessarily agree with Bill that it's as dire as, um, you know, he says it is, I, I don't think MLB's approach is, you know, wrong holistically. I disagree with some of the changes they're trying. I don't think banning shifts does anything to increase balls in play, you know, probably does the opposite. And so I, you know, personally, I can take issue with those. That said, I think it's a pretty good approach to test them out in, you know, places like, you know, independent leagues and even the minor leagues. Um, it does pose challenges for us, but at the same time, those are, you know, interesting challenges because now we need to figure out how to evaluate players who are playing under different sets of rules. Um, and, you know, as you know, someone from an R&D perspective, I think that's a fun, you know, angle. I think it certainly, you know, creates challenges for teams to, you know, that have built a, a roster to play under a certain set of rules and to have, you know, those changed out from under you. Um, you know, I remember a few years ago when they were talking about the strike zone, you know, been talking about not calling the low strike as often. And, you know, I had a team like Pittsburgh that was built off sinker ballers and, you know, it, it really can create some um, unfair, you know, uh, consequences. Um, uh, so from a team standpoint, I'm never gonna, never gonna like rules, you know, to change without fair notice. But um, I think if you're going to do it, you definitely need to, to test it out and be really um, critical about whether those are actually addressing the problems that we think are happening in the sport. I think Bill has said something similar. It's like, let's be clear about what needs to change and actually evaluate whether the rule changes we're, we're talking about um, are going to address that because I'm not sure they all are. Yeah, let me ask you about that, Josh, because it seems like there's a, there's sort of a self-flagellation that's going on where uh, sabermetricians are sort of trying to reckon with what they have done, or, you know, even if uh, Bill is pleading not guilty here, uh, I think others are maybe accepting some measure of, of responsibility, even if it's unintended. So we could be down on ourselves and say, uh, look what we've done uh, and we've, we've ruined the sport. Uh, but I think you could also be more optimistic and say that some of the same tools and technology that have led to these trends uh, maybe could provide a path out of it. You know, maybe we could use this information that is available to us now that's being applied to throw harder and uh, use higher spin rates and higher strikeout rates. Maybe we can use those tools to figure out what steps can be taken to curtail those trends. So Josh, uh, you know, you, you use all that technology, I'm sure that's available for scouting, for player evaluation. Are there applications of that information that we can use to say, here's the problem. And if we actually want to correct it, here are some concrete steps we could take. Yeah, I, 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 I fully believe that. I think first off, number one, I take no responsibility whatsoever. <laughs> um, but no, I, I do think it's kind of one where like, A, those tools have been super useful for giving us a better appreciation of the game and then also the skills that are um, being used during the game and kind of how we can marvel at what these guys are doing on the field. I know, you know, some people are saying it's worse. I actually think it's better because we're seeing that these guys are doing much more impressive stuff than was done even, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but in terms of um, using the, the, the data that we're collecting that we're using, you know, to help make our decisions in terms of how we play the game should also be the same data that's being used to understand how it's affecting the game. Right. And so, you know, Sarah hit on it already. You, you sit there and you want to change, you know, how shifting will affect balls and play, but if batters are still incentivized to try and hit home runs, then how much is, are you really gaining when people are trying to put the ball in the air um, by banning the shift? It's probably not going to be as much as you think. Um, and, you know, we see a lot of that stuff here. So I'm kind of in the same boat as Sarah with a lot of, you know, motivations behind what some of these changes are. Um, but I, I do think now that we are in the business of trying to, you know, if not find causal effects, at least find some really strong correlations, you know, we can use that same data to kind of understand what's most likely to happen if we want to make a change or not. 
Yeah, so Meg, what role do you think the media, the, the public facing bent baseball mm -hmm. analysts can play when it comes to recommending these changes or betting these changes? Because uh, of course, a lot of the cutting edge analysts like Sarah, like Josh have been absorbed into teams. Uh, there's been some brain drain in the public sphere and there are some sources of information that are not available to us in the public that right. are available to teams. But what role can we play in uh, trying to, to steer the sport forward? Well, first teams can stop hiring my staff and then we'll all be available <laughs> to, to do this analysis. I think that you know, we're always going to be downstream of that data. Um, and so some of it is just trying to wrap our arms around it. But I think that writers are, you know, we're trained to help people understand information that they might not at first blush understand. So I think that we occupy a really important spot, um, albeit one with much lower stakes, because if either of your teams don't win a World Series, like I feel badly for you, but that doesn't change my employment prospects. So we're, you know, we're downstream of all of this stuff. But I think that um, we, we have a really important role to use what data we have access to and engage with it critically. And I think take an evidence-based approach to trying to understand what's causing what on the field and what, you know, what might be a, a course correction that is actually pointed in the right direction and at the question that, or problem that the league says it's trying to solve and what might be a misapplication of that kind of information. Because I think that we have to acknowledge there's the competitive balance component of this, there's pace of play, there's, you know, wanting to have a game that's more exciting. Some of those things are working at cross purposes with one another. And some of them aren't about the baseball itself, but about baseball as an entertainment product that's easier to sell to people. And, you know, we want people to like baseball and be engaged with it. But I think that having um, a media apparatus that's able to kind of clearly delineate between those things and then bring data and evidence to bear to say, here's what we think the effect of this rule change is. Here's how we're seeing the shift work or not work um, the way that we might anticipate it to and explain that in a way that's digestible to readers is going to help everyone kind of come to the conversation with a better understanding of not only where the game is now, but where it might be going. So I think that um, we are, you know, we're working with more limited tools and we do see really smart and talented people get hired by teams all the time. But I think that we're still in a good position to help, you know, the maybe not the exactly average fan, but an engaged fan um, appreciate what's working and what's not and, and try to, you know, form their own opinion of what they want baseball to look like. So I want to shift gears slightly before we get to some audience questions. And Bill, I, I wanted to ask, since you occupy a, a different position than the rest of us on this panel in that you've been in both of these worlds, you've been on the inside, you've been on the outside, uh, you sort of managed to, to straddle both for quite a while. And now you have emerged from behind the curtain with the Red Sox again. And I wonder what your years of getting to peek behind that curtain did for the way that you look at the game and your analysis? How has uh, seeing that perspective informed the way that you look at the game and the way that you cover the game? The, uh, <clears throat> I would say that the larger change is that the emergence of guys like yourself and others has pushed a lot of sabermetrics beyond my understanding, frankly, uh, or beyond my interest. And that's a larger change from my standpoint. Uh, I would bet that Josh has learned the same thing and will continue to learn it, which is that scouts are really bright people who love baseball and they're not really hard to talk to or hard to get along with. Uh, and I, I learned more from scouts in the years that I was involved with the Red Sox than I did from uh, management people and analysts. Uh, the uh, and a lot of what we're doing is chasing the understanding that scouts think they already have. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of ways in which scouts, a scout's view is not a perfect view, and we can actually improve it by our contributions. But there are a lot of ways in which their understanding is way ahead of ours, and by Focusing on that and trying to build on it, we can actually improve our own work. Uh, uh, I mean, 
I'm sure that if you had told me this uh, before I worked in, in baseball, I would have thought you were crazy. And I probably wrote that you were crazy. But when you're in an organization, you spend more time worrying about what the clubhouse is doing than what the players are doing. I mean, that, that thing about the players working together rather than working across purposes from one another, that's a real thing. And that's actually what you spend most of your time worrying about in the organization. But there's, at this point in Saber Metro, we don't have any way to describe that. We don't have any way to explain it to an outsider. So it just doesn't get transmitted. I don't know if that works. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you about that, Josh, because you're in this hybrid role really where you're not exactly a traditional scout or a traditional analyst, you're a, a scouting analyst. So how does your work compare to a traditional scout? So what can you pick up on that someone physically sitting in a ballpark might not be able to? And what, if anything, might you miss? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely one where you're trying to combine the best of both worlds, right? Um, because scouts absolutely can kind of fill that gap that we know that um, sabermetrics and analytics can't necessarily capture right now. Um, I mean, when you are kind of going through the process of trying to scout an opponent or scout, uh, you know, a, another professional player. Um, you know, a, a lot of it is like the analytics kind of tell you, you know, what they kind of do good, what they do well, what they don't do well. And then where you're bringing your value in is you can go in and find the answer to the why. Um, why are they able to do this? Why are they able to produce such hard contact, even though they have a ton of swing and miss? Why are they able to kind of do, you know, different facets of their game? Um, the, the, the scouts, I mean, the scouts are very good at what they do. I think what's interesting is a lot of times they got ragged on because they were still beholden to an older style of game. But I think as scouts are learning to realize what is now considered important versus what they were taught was important when they were learning to scout, um, you're starting to see that they do have the ability to kind of recognize what's good and what's bad. They just needed to kind of recalibrate to what the, today's game looks like today. So there's definitely an ability there and there's some value in the information that they have. Um, and it's qualitative information, and that's still good information. Um, and so using that and then using what we can to kind of direct what we're looking for in terms of understanding how a player plays the game, what their strengths and what their weaknesses are, um, is what we're trying to do when we're looking at both the numbers and what the scouts are telling us. And I know there's some discrepancy between teams when it comes to how much information you arm your scouts with, right? Do you want sort of uh, this, you know, non-technology statistics influenced view that you can then synthesize with the all entirely data-driven view? Or do you want to meld those things and give the scouts all that information and yet maybe also color whatever impressions that they might have themselves? Uh, so where do the twins fall on that spectrum? That's the, uh, that's the secret sauce. <laughs> no, it's, um, I, I, I think it's one where it's like, you let the scouts do what they do. Um, you let the scouts kind of go in and give their kind of natural intuitions. But I do think it's kind of one where you want them to be informed in terms of like what type of player we want, what strengths we want, what to look for. Um, and then that allows them to kind of assess, okay, this is what I'm looking for now. Is it good or is it not good? And then trying to go more depth. Why is it good? Why is it not good? Um, you know, uh, a, a lot of things that, we find to be immeasurable. Those are things that we try not to lead on in any way. That's where we think the scout has a strength. But in terms of being able to say, this person is good, this person is bad. That's where we try and color them with information to, to, to have a good idea of where they need to go with their assessments. And Meg, from the, the public perspective, you have uh, people who are more data driven and also scouts who are interested in the data. Uh, yeah. So how do you sort of have those two different departments at Fangrass uh, become part of the same department? Uh, I don't know that uh, department makes it sound so much more formal <laughs> than, than it actually is. Um, I would say that the, the folks who we have looking at prospects are doing a, a combination of both. And I think that um, if only because we have to um, be fairly lean as an organization. We don't have the luxury of having someone who's like never going to look at the data and someone who is. I think that when you look at the way that we approach prospect coverage, it's a combination of both. We're never going to replace the sort of in-person look uh, as an important part of, um, uh, you know, Eric Longenhagen's evaluation of an amateur prospect or a pro prospect. But I think that 
you can look at the way that data has informed the way that um, our prospect writers are engaging with particular guys and see that the data has really helped them sort of rethink what works and what doesn't, right? I think that, um, you know, the more we learn about what makes a good fastball and the direction and shape that it needs to have in order to actually fool a hitter, you know, there are guys who I think public prospect analysis was really high on 10 years ago that now with high speed where we can see how the seams are moving and we understand spin rate, like those guys would not have ranked as highly as they do. And we can look back now and say, oh, well, that's why that guy didn't work out. Like when we look at how his, you know, his fastball moved in the zone, it was running right into barrels the whole time. So no wonder he got hit around, even though he was throwing hard. So I think that it's, it's constantly advancing the understanding of what to look for, but it's not trying to replace the look because you, you do gain a lot from that. Um, you know, I think it's a little different than a, a team's department is going to be because, you know, we're obviously, um, we're not digging into a, a kid's makeup. We're not going to understand what kind of contributor he's going to be in the clubhouse in quite the same way. We, we rely on sourcing from scouts and team people to understand that part, but I think they work really nicely in concert with one another and it's advanced the way that um, our thinking has sort of evolved over the years in a really important way. And Sarah, you've been working in front offices for 10 years or so with the Orioles and then with the Astros. And this has been a, a period of rapid change and advancement. And just as there's been a, a convergence between what we once would have called stats and once would have called scouting information, those things sort of uh, have a lot of overlap now that there's motion tracking technology and we can quantify these things that previously couldn't be quantified. There's also been a lot of convergence between different departments in front offices where quantitative analysis and scouting and drafting and player development all seem to be part of a whole, at least with teams like the Astros, like the Twins. So can you explain how your job has changed over the past decade when it comes to interacting with those other parts of the organization and making sure that you have kind of a, a consistent message? Yeah, um, I mean, I, you mentioned I went from the Orioles to the Astros, and I think that probably had a bigger effect on my experience than just the kind of evolution of the industry. Um, you know, it, I went from a team that was maybe more middle of the pack from in a, in a buy-in um, standpoint to a team that was, you know, near the top, if not at the top. And it makes a huge difference when you're not constantly having to justify your kind of involvement in the discussion. Um, what makes the Astros, you know, unique, I think, not saying there aren't other teams like this, but, um, you know, in a small group of teams is just that there's just full buy-in across the organization. And so we're able to spend our conversation and our time with scouts and coaches kind of to, you know, what Bill was saying, testing their hypotheses, right? Like they can come to us with theories of ideas and we can actually test it with the data and go back and forth and they can learn things and we can learn things. Um, and you, you know, for that to happen, they need to be open-minded to being wrong and we need to be open-minded to being wrong. Um, and I think that, you know, only works when there's kind of open-mindedness across the organization. Um, not saying that wasn't, that didn't exist at the Orioles. It definitely did, but I think it's just organizational here in a different way. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a, a few questions because uh, we've gotten some that are sort of on that subject and I'd be interested in either Sarah or Josh weighing in. This question is, how important is it to have a coach who believes in the analytics? For instance, if the analytics team chooses a player based on certain characteristics, which fit the team criteria, but the coach is not quite convinced, how do you make things work, especially with an important member like a coach who makes all the decisions? So the Astros have had some notable examples of uh, coaches like Brent Strom, for instance, who have very much embraced this information. Uh, twins seem to be the same way. So how important is that? Uh, you know, how do you get everyone on the same page there? And how do you learn what works when it comes to passing that information along? Yeah, well, I can't take credit for the Astros getting everyone on the same page. I think probably Jeff Luno firing a lot of people his first two years was the main reason that that happened so quickly. There was just a lot of turnover here. Um, and the only people that remained were people who were bought in. Um, but to the question, you know, I think it's 
it's important. It's not necessarily any more important than just an organization generally being aligned on an approach to, you know, developing a player, right? So I don't think it has so much to do with the data there as just if a, you know, if the scouts see something in a player and that's not communicated properly to player development and player development isn't, you know, aware of the changes that might need to get made and bought into that player having that potential, then that player is not going to develop as well as they could. Um, and certainly data is one angle that those sort of recommendations can um, emerge, but not the only angle. So, Yeah, Josh, how do you sort of uh, synthesize your scouting insights and provide them to coaches and then to, to players to make sure that those uh, things you pick up on are actually getting used? Yeah. So, you know, the coaches are the coaches, right? Like they're ultimately the ones who are coaching the players, if you will. Right. And so I think the best way that we try to focus on it is, you know, our job is to make the coaches look smarter and that making them look smarter helps with the buy-in from the players. And the fact that we're making them look smarter helps them to kind of buy into what we're saying. And so I think it's kind of one of those where we try to work with the coaches. We try to put the coaches in a good spot. We try to direct them and help them to understand how they can use this to potentially make a player better. And then they get to use their subject matter expert expertise, excuse me, to sit there and actually make the player better or, you know, optimize the player, however you want to describe it. Um, and then I think it becomes kind of a symbiotic, you know, good relationship for all three parties involved. Um, and I think that's how you kind of get that buy-in. I think kind of sitting there and using it to tell the coach what he has to do, um, you know, is always going to be dangerous, but I think kind of sitting there and saying, how can I make your job easier? And then, you know, presenting the information in that way is one way where you get that buy-in. They do a better job of explaining it to the player and hopefully the player is able to perform better. And Bill, when you started working for the Red Sox almost 20 years ago now, how symbiotic was that relationship then? Uh, and did it become more symbiotic over time? I never, I never had any conflict with any scout. I, I always got, got along. Scouts are guys who wear jeans and, and pullover shirts. I'm a guy who wears jeans and pullover shirts. And we got along a lot better than I ever got along with the guys in the suits and ties. Uh, I mean, it, it's the God's truth. I never had any problem with it. But I think, and this is, I disagree with Sarah and Josh to an extent, you can't do anything without buy-in. And there are still a lot of areas as many areas as there ever were, where our field is doing things that will be really important in 30 years, because but it's going to take 30 years to get by it. The uh, it, I I had a lot of ideas for things I thought that the Red Sox could do that is never able to move an inch on because I just, it's just not yet commonly accepted ideas. I mean, by the time I joined the Red Sox, I was working with ideas that had come to be relatively widely accepted, but there is still a lot of, there's still a lot of work in our, in our area. That's if people don't understand it and they don't, they don't believe in it. And so you can't sell it to the organization. That's my experience. Sarah, here's a question from our audience, which is always a popular one and uh, always puts people from teams in an awkward position about what they can and can't say. But where is the information gap between teams and fans and media right now? Is it in <laughs> defensive metrics or some other area? Um, yeah, I don't know if I have a, a great answer for that. I think just generally we're always a little bit ahead in terms of the technology that we have access to. Um, and so the data is just getting better from a you know biomechanics standpoint, a bat tracking standpoint. I don't think that's a secret that that's out there, but it's unfortunately for the public, not available to the public. Um, probably a good thing for us, you know, as a team, just because, you know, it, it, allows us to keep any competitive advantages a little bit longer. Um, but, you know, I certainly understand the, the frustration in the public sphere. <laughs> uh, and here's one, I, I guess, for Sarah or Josh. Uh, there were a couple hirings late last year. The Phillies hired Sam Fold as their GM and the Rangers hired Chris Young as their GM, former major league players. But that is a rarity these days. Uh, and the question is, what do you make of the declining proportion of former players in front offices and executive positions? Do you think this will change moving forward, perhaps as we have this new generation of uh, very analytically savvy players who can maybe then transition into front office roles if they're interested in doing that? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. I, I think that's kind of the biggest key that you hit on right now. Uh, as front offices um, became a little bit more analytically driven, um, the, the players that were in the field at the time weren't necessarily inclined to change to go the same way. Um, and so I think that's what you're kind of seeing is there is a gap in terms of, you know, the skills that are needed, the skills that are required, and the skills that are present in the player pool. But that's that's changing pretty quickly. A lot of the younger players are seeing what's happening. They're seeing what decisions are being made. They're understanding how these things are at least, you know, affecting their careers. They might not fully get it in terms of being able to be an analyst themselves, but we've seen a couple guys can. And so they're starting to understand where that value is. And I think you're going to see that it will actually swing a little bit up and players will have both the experience and also the background understanding to be able to kind of come in and fill roles in the front office. And oh, do you want to chime in on that, sir? Um, yeah, sorry, real quick. I, I also, I think that people, former players are probably more involved than fans realize, um, you know, really successful former players probably don't want to work the hours that, front office executives work, but that doesn't mean that they aren't involved in conversations. Um, in both my organizations, I've had relationships with former players. Um, and, you know, it, it generally exists more like, you know, Bill has talked about this hypothesis testing. They see something, they have ideas, they can give you ideas. Um, they have theories that you can test and there can be that back and forth. They may not be involved, you know, in the office day to day, but I think, you know, they're still in the picture, maybe more than people realize. And what I wanted to ask you, Meg, is uh, I wonder how you handle the conflicting demands or the different audiences that Fangraphs is catering to these days, whether it is sort of the hardcore stat savvy sabermetricians or people who are interested in looking at the game in different ways or, or maybe are just getting introduced to that way of looking at things. And Really, as sabermetrics as sabermetrics has has broadened, you know, I, I guess as Bill defined it, it was the search for objective knowledge about baseball, which was not necessarily statistical in nature. And uh, these days, there are all sorts of searches for objective knowledge about baseball. So, how has Fangraphs uh, gone along with uh, the broadening of what sabermetrics is and what a sabermetric site can cover? Sure, I think that um, you know you've hit on it. It's it's been an expansion. I think that the um, the through line has been trying to approach whatever question you're answering with rigor and with evidence. And so I think that the the definition of what a Fangraphs piece is has really broadened out over the years. Partly because I think that we were maybe a little overly narrow in terms of. Um, what we were covering, but also because I think that just sports media in general has come to understand that what is a baseball story is a much bigger conversation than we were necessarily allowing ourselves to have previously. So we want to help our readers understand the game better. And sometimes that's going to be a really clear cut, you know, bread and butter down the middle fan graphs piece where we take a picture and we say, here are the five things he changed. Here's why his changeup is better than you thought it was. Here's why he's suddenly good. There's going to be a lot of that, but some of it's going to be, you know, here are the, the social and political questions that are impacting who's playing baseball and who's working in a front office and who's shaping the game that we have. And if we want to understand the sport in total, we're going to need to ask you know, bigger and different questions than, than, you know, why, you know, why is Max Scherzer good? I think we have, we've got that one figured out by now. So um, I think it allows us to help our readers understand the sport better by understanding it more broadly. And then, you know, we have a, a touch of fun and whimsy thrown in there too, because baseball is fun and it's never been better in terms of the people playing it than it is right now. So we're going to, you know, we're going to enjoy Mike Trout. We're going to enjoy Ronald Acuna Jr. Why wouldn't we? These guys are incredible. So I think that um, we, we're still approaching it from a place of wanting to understand and test and bring evidence to bear on the questions that we're asking. But those questions themselves are just uh, broader than they used to be. All right, well, I think we are uh, just about up on our time here. So thanks to everyone for the questions and thanks to everyone on the panel for doing this. Really enjoyed talking to all of you today.